Welcome to Arbitration Life. I am Janet Brin. And I'm Hannah Dumas. So the BBI International Arbitration Center recently concluded BBI Arbitration Week. What a week it was. Due to the ongoing pandemic, this was our first time hosting a primarily remote conference. So we certainly missed having practitioners from around the world join us here in, in the BBI. Yeah. However, through technology, we were still able to gain insight from over 14 conference sessions. A highlight for me was naturally Arbitral Women on Diversity, presented by Arbitral Women and moderated by Hannah and I. It was just so great to be able to take part in a discussion that included three highly successful women in arbitration. And of course, the Dr. J.S. Archibald QC Memorial Lecture is always a significant highlight as it celebrates a highly respected QC whose great vision and notable work resulted in the development of arbitration in this jurisdiction. This year's lecture was given by Dame Janice M. Piera, DBE Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. It was definitely a memorable week, uh, and I really, really enjoyed those sessions as well. Uh, I would also like to highlight uh, the session on the BVIIC uh, arbitration rules updates and encourage everyone to look at for our new BVIIC arbitration rules, which will enter into force on 16th of November. Uh, but as we talk conference, our friends at uh, NIAC and in New York are getting ready for their New York uh, Arbitration Week. Uh, New York Arbitration Week will kick off on the 15th of November. Today's guest is joining us today to talk a bit about New York Arbitration Week and in addition to her amazing career with more than 25 years of experience advising clients on the resolution of complex disputes arising out of international business transactions. She regularly advises clients on a variety um, of issues relating to international dispute resolution, including forum selection, jurisdiction, service of process, extraterritorial discovery, and enforcement of judgments, as well as drafting of arbitration, dispute resolution, and choice of court clauses. Uh, she repeatedly has been named uh, the best lawyers in the best lawyers in America and Low Dragon 500 leading lawyers in America as well as to Low Dragon's uh, inaugural Global Litigation 500 list in uh, 2021. Among several recognitions, she has uh, also been recognized uh, by the Legal 500 Latin America. She currently serves as co-chair of New York Arbitration Week 2021 and chair of the New York City Bar Association Arbitration Committee. She also is a member of the Working Group on Cybersecurity and International Arbitration formed by the International Council for Commercial Arbitration, uh, the New York City Bar Association and the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution, which received the Best Development uh, 2018 Award by uh, Global Arbitration Review. Please welcome Leah Haberkrug. Welcome to Arbitration Life, Leah. It's good to see you. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me today. Awesome. All right. Well, I mean, we're just uh, seeing the view of your office. Can I see the Empire State Building behind you? You can, <laughs> yeah, there it is. That's wonderful. So greetings from New York. Great. Greetings from the BVI. Hopefully you will be able to come see us very soon. Um, so Leah, you are a partner in uh, the International Litigation and Ar Arbitration Department of Skadden, based in the New York office. You have more than 25 years of experience advising clients on the resolution of complex disputes arising out of international business transactions. You represent clients from around the world in federal and state courts in the United States, as well as in international and domestic arbitrations. Could you please tell us more about your role? Uh, what is your favorite thing about it? And uh, what is your favorite thing about arbitration in general, you would say? Um, well, so I started out as a, a general commercial litigator, and over time, my practice has become more and more international until um, ultimately, probably actually the last 20 years, that's become my primary focus. Um, 
and my firm's international arbitration practice is somewhat unique in that all of us were trained in both litigation and arbitration. So we can provide clients with a seamless representation with the same team for the litigation and, and arbitration aspects of the case. So if you need to go to court for interim measures or to compel arbitration or enforce an award, we do all of that. Um, and I also give strategic advice to our clients right at the beginning when they're drafting arbitration clauses and forum selection clauses. Um, and then finally, we also act as um, coordinating counsel working with local counsel where a client has a dispute spanning multiple jurisdictions and across arbitration and litigation. Um, I would say that the, my favorite thing about the international aspect of my practice is getting to work with clients and counsel all over the world and um, learning about other legal systems from lawyers trained in different legal traditions. And that's always been, always been really fascinating. Um, and as to arbitration, I would say um, that I have um, sort of two favorite um, aspects of that. Um, first, I really love working with, um, with opposing counsel and with the, the arbitrators to design a dispute resolution um, process that's best for the parties and their particular dispute. And second, um, I also really love doing hearings. Um, and so, you know, while it's somewhat counterintuitive, I actually get to do a lot more work in the nature of trial work um, as in arbitration than I did in, in litigation. Um, so for example, I had one, um, one arbitration where we obtained a, a $1.2 billion award for a client after a week long wow. hearing. And in litigation disputes of that magnitude rarely actually yeah. go to trial. So it's, it's, it's really fun and it's, it's really challenging. So on top of the amazing work that you do in arbitration and litigation, you are also involved in New York Arbitration Week where you're mm -hmm. the organizing committee co-chair. Yep. Could you please tell us a bit about what led you to, what led to the creation actually, and maybe describe some of the challenges in organizing such a, event, especially during these times. Particularly during these times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the purpose of New York Arbitration Week is to, um, to showcase New York as a leading global seat for international arbitration and a, a center for thought leadership in the field. Um, you know, we have amazingly talented practitioners and arbitrators and academics, and we have a, a really active, vibrant arbitration community. Um, New York commercial law is very well developed and stable, which is why it's frequently, um, you know, it's frequently chosen by people in their commercial contracts. Um, and our courts take a favorable view of arbitration. So it's no wonder that, um, that New York is a popular seat for international arbitration. Um, but New York Arbitration Week actually is very young. Um, the first New York Arbitration Week was in 2019 as an initiative led by NIAC, which is a nonprofit organization um, that promotes international arbitration in New York and the New York branch of the Chartered Institute. And so 2021 is actually only the third New York Arbitration Week we've had. And from an organizing perspective, all three years have been totally different. And that's really um, been our biggest challenge. Um, so, you know, due to the pandemic, we've been reinventing it every year. Um, the first one in 2019, the events were entirely in person, and I don't think anybody had Zoom on their, um, on their computers <laughs> yet. Um, last year, the organizing committees had to switch to an entirely virtual program midstream, and um, we were able to do that actually um, with invaluable technical assistance of, of FTI, who is also generously working with us again this year. Um, but in the course of that, we learned actually that there's a real benefit to the virtual aspects because our programming can be accessible to people all over the world who might not be able to travel to New York. Um, and we could have a much greater diversity of speakers on our programs. Um, now this year, um, and Matt, Matt Draper is my, my co-chair. Um, it's been a total roller coaster as we were kind of hoping to pivot to some sort of hybrid programming um, so we could benefit, you know, maintain the benefits of the virtual programming, but also get people together. 
And all year, it's really not been clear what would be feasible. Um, so finally, really only a few weeks ago, we made the decision that um, most of our programming will be virtual, but there'll be two in-person cocktail parties, one at the beginning of the week and one at the end of the week for people who are here and are comfortable um, gathering together. So I think it's gonna be really, really great. Um, and I'm not even gonna speculate as to what next year <laughs> could possibly look like. Right, yeah. Well, we could totally re relate. Um, yeah. I think we went through the same challenges. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it's gonna be great. And it's definitely the advantage that we have to focus on being able to reach people from all around the world who might not be able to travel. And to, and to get their perspectives as speakers too, because yeah. um, uh, that really adds another dimension that we didn't have before. Yeah, right, right, indeed. No, it's great. I, I think it's it's a great format, and we were even discussing to keep the hybrid format. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, to come. yeah, it's likely never to go away. Well, not anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> the, the cocktail reception, because this this is exactly what we did uh, in the BVI. We had two cocktail receptions, and uh, those were fun, fun moments. So. Best of luck for New York Arbitration Week. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we'll be together next year. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Now, Leah, uh, would you say you chose arbitration or arbitration chose you? Um, I would say that it definitely chose me. Oh, um, that's good. <laughs> I mean, when I went to law school 30 years ago, there, you know, there just weren't the type of programs in international arbitration that we have today. So, you know, today both NYU and Columbia have centers on international arbitration and, and litigation. And those were only though about 10 years old. So, you know, as I said, I started as a commercial litigator and then the world just evolved and I started doing doing both. And, and um, I love it for the reasons we talked about earlier. Mm. Thank you. What difficulties or even failures taught you the most in your career? So I would say, you know, my greatest challenge, both professionally and personally, was dealing with um, a very serious and sudden health issue that one of my children had about five years ago. Um, and I continued to work during his illness and, and treatment, and he's fine now. In fact, he just called me as I was getting on the, getting on the Zoom. Um, but I really had to step back for about 18 months and change my focus and my, my priorities. Um, and, and I would say that I learned from that, that, you know, life is, is totally unpredictable and can have its up and downs, but your career and your reputation are really built over many years. And, um, there are times when the career aspects might have to take a, a back seat and then you have to spend time rebuilding, but that's okay. And, um, I, I think that's a lesson. A lot of people are learning also with the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And glad to hear that your son is doing good. He's doing great. Yep. <laughs> um, so now, Leah, would you say that during your career, you have experienced uh, unconscious or conscious gender bias? Definitely. Um, <laughs> and I was thinking about, um, you know, I just I have I thought I'd, I'd share with you a couple a couple stories about that. There are um, mm -hmm. A number of examples that come to mind throughout my career, but you know, it, these are the blatant ones I'm actually aware of. You know, a lot of this you have no idea what what goes on beyond you know what you're actually aware of. But um, one of my partners was telling the story the other day to our associates, and I, and I hadn't thought about it in a long time. But when we were young lawyers traveling together, people would constantly assume that I was his paralegal or his secretary. Mm -hmm. um, and it was partly because I was young, but he wasn't much older or more experienced, but still people, when we would go people, they'd think he had brought his secretary with him. So, um, you know, so that, that was a little bit interesting. Um, and then the year I became a partner, we had a client come to the firm who told the head of our litigation department that he wouldn't work with a woman. So <laughs> he just didn't work with women, didn't like okay. them, wasn't going to do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the head of our litigation department um, put me in charge of the matter without giving me that background um, and told the client that, you know, this was the team. And if you wanted to hire us, this is this is who was going to work on it. Um, and we did that and worked out very well. And he ultimately went on to hire a female general counsel. Um, okay. 
but I was always like really grateful and very proud about the way that the firm handled that. Because as I said, you don't always know when those situations are, are going to come up. So, um, and then I guess the last one I would say is about, about 10 years ago. So by that time, I'd been practicing for a long time and I was, I was on a conference call with two other law firms um, representing other parties. And we were conferring about discovery issues and it got a bit heated as sometimes things do. And suddenly one of the lawyers responded to one of my points by saying, well, honey. <laughs> <And> <gasps> <laughs> so I was just stunned in the, and the associates in the room are looking at me like, what are you going to do about this? And right. then the other male counsel jumps on the phone and starts defending my honor and saying, what did you just call her? Um, but, you know, we just, we moved on from that and um, <laughs> finished our, finished our debate. And, um, you know, it's you sort of, sometimes you have to take advantage um, in those situations where people are underestimating you because you're you're a woman and you have to just plow forward and make the best of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Sometimes people try to throw you off your throw you off balance. So, yeah. Um, kudos to you for actually you know, <laughs> holding your own. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. Well, I still, you know, it's still not uncommon to be the only woman in the, in the room. And I don't generally right. notice it until somebody comments on it. Um, so obviously people are still conscious about it, but yeah, yeah. Um, I had a colleague who said she decided to turn that into a positive and use it as an opportunity to be noticed and stand out. She said, you know, if you're the only person in the room, nobody's going to forget, you know, forget who you are and you do a good job and people will remember that. So. Excellent. That's a good way to say it. And I like really like the anecdotes and the fact that the, the way the firm handled it, I, th I think that was really bold and not giving you a yep. heads up too. Exactly. Like, I didn't know till later. They didn't tell me until we were done with yeah. it. But, um, but yeah, I, I am really proud of the way they, ha they handled it. They said, look, this is who we are. And if you want to hire us, this is, um, you know, this is what you have to yeah. do. So, so it, it's, um, it, it was a good moment for them. Yeah, that's a great story. Yeah. So on that note, what piece of advice would you give to students or young lawyers who are perhaps studying arbitration or international arbitration, I should say? So I would say to get to know as many people in the field as you can. Um, but, but by that, I don't mean like send emails to people you don't know asking for like you know, information interviews and coffees. And a lot of people do that. And it's not a strategy that's really effective or productive. Um, I would say instead, you know, join committees, join bar groups, join law school groups, mood courts, um, and strive to become somebody um, with a reputation who's willing to work hard and who people like to work with and want to work with. Um, and also keep in touch with your peers who, you know, will advance in the world more quickly than you might imagine. Um, you know, and your professors who can vouch for you and who can make um, introductions. Um, and you'd be sort of surprised where those, where those threads lead. So I think it's going to be easier once uh, we open up again and we're in person. But, um, you know, in the meantime, people can really take advantage of the virtual programming opportunities to... Um, to learn about the field and who's who, and um, they can start doing that by registering for International Arbitration Week in New York. Of course, <laughs> thank you for that. So we have a bonus question for you as we come to our close. Uh-oh, okay. Yes, we like, you're in New York, so you're in New York, right? Yep. All right, so are you team how to get away with murder or soup? Oh, how to get away with murder. Oh, wow, that's good. That's our favorite too. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. We always like to check with our, you know, our the persons that we interview yeah. on what their legal shows are, how much you get into those Netflix shows that cover legal <laughs> themed shows. Yeah. So what do you like the most about how to get away with murder? Um it's just an it's a it's an interesting perspective. I mean, the the Seuss thing is kind of, it's always kind of interesting when it's sort of more similar to what you do, and you know it, it gets sort of glamorizes people, um, you know, yeah. getting their suits and high heels and ride in um, you know ride in in dial cars and things, which um, which is great, but um, not you know may, maybe not as exciting as it looks. 
<laughs> so you don't have a driver downstairs waiting for you? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> As too soon to have us believe that we have we have yeah, drivers. Right? In the <laughs> I know, right? I know. That's fun. Well, Leah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure getting to know you better and learn more about New York Arbitration Week, as long as, in addition, just, just having fun with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, for, Leah, and best of luck again for New York Arbitration Week. We'll be watching. Uh, uh, we'll be, turn your cameras on, so we'll be looking for you. <laughs> Are you going to do that? We do not do that for New York Arbitration Week. I don't think people would want that. <laughs> That would okay. be interesting, though. Okay. Well, it'll be, and it'll be great to hear what you think about the programming, and, and hopefully we'll have you with us next year. Yeah, yeah, definitely. yes. Great. Thank you so much, All Leah. Right. Thank you. Many thanks to Leah Haber Cup for a busy schedule to talk to us here on Arbitration Live. For more Arbitration Live, please be sure to hit the subscribe button and to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Arbitration Live. Thank you.